Hey guys, I'm Dr. Kim Sage. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. This video is all about dissociation, dissociation in CPTSD, dissociation and shame, and how all of those connect to the journal series I've been working on, on chronic complex trauma and shame. As I've said in many videos, I really do believe that the I am unworthy, I am unlovable, I am bad belief system is often the core of what happens to us when we are raised by certain caregivers who struggle. And so that chronic interpersonal nature of trauma that we are experiencing at the hands of caregivers really sets us up to decide that if I really acknowledge as a child that my caregiver is not safe, what does that say about me? Um, that means I won't be safe, I won't survive. So therefore, it must be something wrong with me. And we drag this whole belief system of not being good enough and it shows up in every relationship with everyone, including ourselves. So let's talk today really quickly about what dissociation looks like in the classic sense. Then I'm gonna go into a more complicated version of explaining dissociation and the dissociation role in, in CPTSD that is more complex. In fact, I shot this video yesterday, but it was so wordy and so complicated, I decided to redo it. And now um, I'm in a rush to make coconut cupcakes, so I'm trying to get through this video, but I also want to make sure I don't talk so much and, and the concepts don't get so, you know, therapized that you lose the part that I think is most helpful. So please feel free if you want to post more questions. I will probably make another more extensive video, especially about the part that's related to the dissociation that we see in CPTSD. And so we'll come back to that, all right? Before I do though, please don't forget to subscribe and click the bell, and that way you'll get notified when I post new videos. I'm gonna try to slow down. You guys know I probably talk too fast so much. Okay, so dissociation really is a response to an overwhelming emotion. Basically, our brains and bodies are saying, this is too much for me, I need to go somewhere else. Now, the classic dissociation we often think about can really be everything from what they call often highway hypnosis, where you, you know, leave somewhere and you drive home and you know you're there, but you have no memory of the drive home, to spacing out, to daydreaming, even a daydreaming that can get a little unhealthy at times where you're sort of like, you know, planning out and playing out a story or dream in your life to a way that really removes you from the present all the way into full-on dissociation and dissociative disorders, which I'm not gonna go into in terms of the, uh, the disorders today. I'm gonna use the word dissociation in a kind of classic sense, but also not so classic as I talk to you more about this idea of the role it plays in CPTSD. Now, I like to think of it as this. Oftentimes, if you've ever had a really horrible thing happen to you, you know, something that you got shocking news about, or you maybe gave a speech in public, but something that is not your norm. You might look back on that event and say to yourself, yeah, I was there, but I wasn't there. I was sort of hovering over my body or in the room, but it wasn't really me. And I can say that I've had a few times in life where I've received tragic news and I felt like, or I've, or I've actually been in the middle of an emergency where I was doing everything right in the moment, but I feel like I was like hovering above my body, right? So there's some classic components we call depersonalization, which is being disconnected or detached from your person, from yourself, and derealization, which is really being detached or feeling separated from the environment, like it's a dream, it's not real. And so those, are, those can be components of dissociation. Now, other ways we can know we're in dissociation, like I said, are feeling like we're out of our body, feeling a sense of um, actually disconnection from feeling our bodies themselves, so being more numb. We can also see some self-harm occur in those states because we are detached from ourselves, and sometimes the self-harming behaviors will reconnect us to ourselves. We can feel that we are floating above ourselves, we can lose sense of time and space, we can have tunnel vision, we can get lost in another fantasy world, like movies or books. We can really just feel like we are a completely different person sometimes, right? So I'll list a few more of those. But that's sort of the classic way we think of dissociation. Basically, I'm going along in life and something happens and it is too much for me to psychologically bear. And so I go somewhere else. Now, if you're having highway hypnosis, it doesn't mean necessarily you've had 
major trauma, although we do know that trauma is very much connected to dissociation. So some form of mild dissociation is very, very, very common. And it's something that we just do as humans. I think that all of us who live a decently long life, it's gonna happen to you, right? And so you're gonna maybe sometimes have trauma and go places. But when we talk about chronic, complex, interpersonal trauma, like we find in complex PTSD, what we're talking about here is that we are often faced with situations where we are struggling to survive. And in these traumas, they're often little, little repeated traumas, they could be massive traumas, and they can really go to the heart of what it means to try to be safe and try to survive. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next, which is the structural dissociation model. And that really is this idea that we have dissociation, like I said, as a response to a difficult situation that we can't bear. And so oftentimes it can be so, so difficult to even um, integrate and accept that the trauma lives outside of us in a separate part, right? So what I'm saying is I have my main part of myself. My main part of myself is Kim, the psychologist. It's Kim, the mom. It's Kim, the, you know, the, uh, I don't know, the group member, whatever it is. And then let's say I have a trauma. Let's say it's a pretty big trauma. I don't, I can't live in that. If it's an unprocessed trauma and it was, let's say I was, I don't know, let's say I was robbed at gunpoint, okay? And I, and I almost died. And I cannot let myself be in that every day because I wouldn't be able to function. So I fragment that off. I put that somewhere else. And I put on what we basically call our normal everyday selves. That's sort of my left brain, classic idea of left brain structure. I'm doing things, I'm being a mom, I'm engaging with my patients, I may have a relationship that I show up in a certain way. And I can sort of integrate all of those a bit. But those are not compatible with this very emotional right brain experience of the robbery, let's say or let's also say of repeated trauma in childhood by an unstable caregiver. So what do I mean by that? What I'm saying is that this is the core of this model of um, structural dissociation. What I think is so fascinating is that when we are children, let's say with a borderline or narcissistic parent, but let's stick to borderline, let's say an untreated borderline or um, classic disorganized attachment experience of the parent, right? So we often do see a relationship between BPD and disorganized attachment in children. So let's say you have a parent, even without the label of anything, that is just, you know, really runs the gamut of being, you know, frightening and frightened and unstable and a little bit safe, but, you know, unpredictable, all the way up to not safe at all. As children, as we've talked about attachment theory, we have to attach to survive, right? Even if you think of breastfeeding in its original form, we need other people to survive. So kids who have a, a caregiver like this, let's call it a primary caregiver, they are faced with an impossible tug of war and dilemma. On the one hand, they need to attach to survive. They need something and someone to be there for them to somewhat protect them and keep them safe. But what if, as in disorganized attachment, that person is also the source of fear and danger. So there's this dilemma, right? There's this, I need the person for my safety and security, but I'm also terribly afraid of them and I need to be because they're scary and dangerous and risky. And so what happens in the dissociation of this issue is that when we were having ways we could integrate it, like I was talking about before, like I have the Kim the this and Kim the that, that's one thing. But when I keep having repeat traumas, the fragments become different pieces all over the place. And I can't cope with all of that because I can't really integrate the fact that what's supposed to be safe is not safe. And I have to also protect myself and access these other parts of myself to survive. Now the parts are often described as the classic trauma types. Okay, so when we talk about how we respond to trauma in a classic CPTSD dynamic with dissociation, as I mentioned in this um, structural dissociation model, we're really looking at how we're showing up. So we're either showing up as our normal everyday selves, right, the different roles we have, even though those can also be split apart and have sort of separate ways of functioning, or we are operating in our traumatized child self part. And this will be the part you're gonna use for the journal prompts if you're sticking around and doing this, okay? But as you think about, even if you're not gonna do the journal, what 
would be those parts that my child self used to deal with the opposite of the attachment problem I had, the defending myself, the survival part that I had to sort of, the part I had to do and be to make all of it um, keep me alive and keep me somewhat safe, even if the word, you know, safe is, you know, highly debatable, right? So we have the, the normal part of life self and we have the traumatized self. Now, the traumatized child self, that's the part we can split into, the part we can dissociate into when we're triggered. And so these are the parts I want you to think about and explore. And as I said, I'll post them down below. We have fight, flight, freeze, submit, collapse, attach, cry out for help, and appease and please. And so really quickly, when you're in the fight response, you are in your vigilant response. You are angry, judgmental, mistrustful, controlling, destructive. It's that very much, you know, I need to push back to survive. When you're in your flight self, you are in that more escaping. You are taking off. Like in a, in a battle, like I mentioned, you might be out of there, right? But this is where you're, you distance yourself. You're ambivalent. You run away. You can't commit. Or you are... Um, addictive or eating disorders, what they talk about. Now with the freeze response, this is a result of fear. This is like that thing where animals play dead to survive, right? So it's, or, or humans do actually too in, in violent situations. We're frozen, we're terrified, we're wary, we're phobic of being seen, and often you can see panic attacks that go with that. When we talk about submit or collapse, this is often times where we see depression, shame, filled with self-hatred, passiveness, being the good girl or, or caretaker and self-sacrificing. And those are really about just sort of completely, um, you know, just letting yourself fall, fall down in terms of not really bringing your full self in in order to survive. And we often think of dissociation as an attempt to disappear, to be invisible. And that's what we're doing when we're going into all of these coping types, right? We are somehow going somewhere else to deal with whatever's happening. And it may not necessarily have been the ideal response, but the, the self-compassion here is that it was, it was what you had to do to survive. And that's really important. And then we have attach, cry out for help. And that's where we're looking for connection, but it's a desperate look for connection. And we're fearful of being abandoned and rejected and we can be um, wanting someone to lean on. And this particular part of a, of a trauma type can look like borderline, which is a whole different video. And therapists can misinterpret a client's needs for this attached cry out for help as being very borderline-y. And so um, it's important to understand that once you pick a label, you start following the label down the road, you look for more evidence, you're probably gonna get there. So we wanna make sure we're separating when we're in that state where we all desperately need to be attached and be safe versus uh, a full-on disorder, which like I said, is another video I'll come back to. And we have a please and please. And this is really that people pleasing and disregarding ourselves, that fawn response to get our needs met. So I want you to think about as you go into the journal prompts, which of these you tend to use in terms of your own um, defensive styles. What did you have to do and how does that show up today? And I'll discuss that more in the next few seconds in the journal prompts. So. So the root of dissociation is that regardless of whether we are talking about the sort of classic, I need to go somewhere else in the moment or spacing out or being triggered to falling back into my sort of dissociated responses of trauma, all of those remove me from real connection, from real empathy often, from real self-compassion and dissociation along with shame, which is remember that sort of internalized self-blame unfairly you know, placed on ourselves, often the root of I am bad from caregivers who were unstable or wounding and things like that, is that our shame and our dissociation both remove us from connection to ourselves and others. And they act as like personal boundaries and barriers against the things that will actually help us because what helps us is truly being self-compassionate, knowing how to get our bodies safe, which is why I discussed those in the first couple of videos in the journal. Safe place, self-compassion, and being able to integrate the parts of ourselves that are wounded and that we've used to cope is part of what the therapy looks like when you talk about how to heal CPTSD, how to start to learn to calm our bodies, do some breathing, respond, let's say, in that conflict with a partner from a place of, um, of awareness, from a place of connection 
and, and calm. And so that's hard to do if we've sort of gone into that dissociated part of ourselves that is defending and protecting and surviving. So as I said, I'll make another video on this whole concept because I think it's so fascinating. But I want you to know that when we're talking about healing shame, we're talking about how to get in connection, how to have healing and self-compassion, and how to stay present-minded. And that's why dissociation is such a huge part of this journal part, is understanding where do you go? What are those dissociated parts of yourself? Where do you actually go when you are going somewhere else? And so how can you learn to get yourself more grounded and back in the present? Because all of those strategies prevent us from being seen and known and from knowing and seeing and feeling and hearing other people um, in, in addition to ourselves, okay? So, so in terms of this journal issue, I want you guys to hopefully join with me now and um, we will start the journal part. So if you do not want to do the journal, this would be a good time to just end the video. If you want to begin the journal process, you can go back and check out these videos that I just made that are really the beginning of creating your journal. And I lost the front part of my journal cover, the picture, but you can get any kind of journal, anything from just any kind of notebook and pens and paper all the way to markers and things like that. So if you're just joining me today, um, just to give you an example, this is just part of a journal that I've started working on that talks about our shame and our shame triggers and inner child and things like that. If you just started doing the journal with me, you know that the first couple exercises were all about getting grounded in safe place and self-compassion because the work of complex trauma can be so triggering. Now, this journal is a self-directed journal. It is not therapy with me, but it is something you can do with yourself. So please make sure you're safe enough to do something like that, you know, your own kind of journal series. But if you're having periods of dissociation that are causing distress for you, I would highly encourage you to be evaluated by a licensed mental health professional, okay? So when we talk about this dissociation in the journal, what we're gonna do is do some real actual prompts now. So before I do that though, let me just quickly say that when we're talking about the different types of functioning in terms of the, hi honey, are you getting water right now? <laughs> okay, all right, my daughter's in the kitchen, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, okay, so what we're talking about with the trauma types are those classic, like I said, please and appease, collapse, submit, attach, cry out for help, flight, fight, and freeze. And so I'm gonna down below list the typical um, behaviors we see in those categories. You can refer to those and maybe that will give you more information. Maybe I'll make a PDF of it and put it on my um, mailing list too. But what you want to know is that when you're in these different responses, you are just trying to, these would be your typical coping things, the things you had to do to survive and protect yourself in your childhood. So when I, when I read you this first prompt, it really is to do this. It is to write a letter or talk to the different parts of yourself, the different trauma types. And the idea that you needed to attach, you needed to attach to your caregivers and you needed to survive and protect yourself were these two things that caused a lot of dilemma for you. And so those are gonna play out in your relationships today. Meaning that in today's, let's say, let's say with your partner, you have this need to be close to them and attach and also to protect yourself. And based on your story, it might be that when you get too close with attachment, um, you get triggered and you find ways to self-sabotage or, or and they're not really on purpose, but they end up being sabotaging because you're falling back into your trauma type. So maybe your trauma type is to hit the road. When conflict happens, you just leave. Or when things get bad, you just get super aggressive. So I want you to think about that, that dilemma that you had as a child where you were trying to deal with attaching and protecting and how that plays out in your relationships today. And so you wanna recognize the different parts of yourself and how they might encourage or interfere with connection and relationship. So if that makes sense, you're really gonna explore in your current relationships how those two dynamics in your childhood that were likely about survival versus attachment show up today. And as I said, I'll post below what, what those coping mechanisms or those parts might be in terms of your trauma type, okay? And then the second one is to ask yourself, the second prompt is to ask yourself, okay, well, what helps me get back into connection and empathy with myself and other people when I'm being triggered? So what are the mechanisms you use? Is it things like, 
you know, being with others, calling friends, doing art, taking a walk, uh, accomplishing a goal, setting a task for yourself. You need to figure out what those are for you. But what helps get you back into connection, more into a grounded sense of self, and into, more, um, and into a more mindful awareness of the relationship with yourself and others um, as a result of those early, you know, sort of parts and wounds you have. And the last part is write a self-statement of empathy about your struggle. And so you're going to write some kind of short self-compassionate statement that sort of gives you love and, and worthiness that you can connect back to about what you've been through in terms of this, this battle that you probably had to deal with your dissociation with this need to survive and protect or to the fact that you do space out, you do go other places, and that when you do that, you realize on some level you are literally also leaving the relationship, but that you do it because you were trying to survive, and that you're a survivor, and that you love yourself, and you're worthy, and things like that. So, let me give you some quick examples, okay? So this kind of makes sense. So the first one is, like I said, write a letter or talk to the parts of yourself who tend to struggle with um, attachment, and with defending yourself in your relationship today. So let's say my example is in my husband today, I find that on the one hand, I want to be close. I want to be loving and connected and seen and vulnerable. But sometimes when he criticizes me or has feedback even, I read it as full on aggression, as rejection. And so either I shut down, um, let's say that's what I do. Let's say I shut down, I, I just, I please and appease or I shut down, I don't share what I really need, but I hold it in. And that wound and that resentment of not feeling seen grows more and more, and so I might move further and further apart from him. That's an example. So all, as I said, I'll give you some more ideas down below, but that's one of the things I do, is that my coping mechanism is to just keep it all in, keep that caregiver good, don't get too upset with me, and make it all okay, but I'm basically like completely out of whack in my nervous system. I'm, 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 I'm anxious or I'm angry, but I'm stuffing it all down. And so all of that prevents me from getting close, even when things are good, because let's say the next day things are good, but I'm still holding on to that, that comment, that thing I felt was somehow um, uh, defensive and attacking. And so I just can't let myself relax with him. I just can't be myself and lean in. Or I'm just kind of like holding the space psychologically of being more distant. That's an example. And so I'd want to talk to that part of myself in my letter or, you know, in my drawing and sort of draw it out and think about, well, what would it take to solve that problem? What would it take for me to be more connected and more mindful? And so I would explore how I might ground myself and learn to work on the tools of how to talk to him and express my needs as opposed to shutting down so that we can become more closely attached, okay? That's the part where it says, you, you know, how do you recognize the parts of yourself that either interfere or encourage? So how could I encourage connection as opposed to shutting it down? Okay. Number two, what helps you um, get into connection with others and yourself? For me, I would say it might be being alone, which is probably another part of my childhood, but doing things like taking a walk and clearing my mind or doing art. For me, as an introvert, those are the things that get me back on track and or spending loving time with my family, with my kids, right? To just get back into connection and play a board game or watch a movie or things like, you know, um, take a bath with a candle, something like that. And then the number three is write a self-statement of empathy about your struggle. So I would say, Kim, um, I recognize that you have overcome many difficulties and I really want you to remember, you know, how strong you are, how much love you have for others and what a survivor you are, something like that, right? So um, don't be so harsh on yourself. You're doing the best you can, something like that. Okay, so I know this is a long video, but those are the examples. And um, thank you so much for watching. Please stay safe and well. And please feel free to share your comments and thoughts. As I said, again, I will make a list down below of the classic uh, parts that can get activated. And I know this is a lot to sort of take in. It took me a few times to sort of try to explain it the right way. But no matter what you're doing, whether you're dissociating as a part of your you know, single trauma event or you are going into your trauma type parts and responses, whatever you're doing, those tend to often bring up a lot of shame because they reinforce those negative messages of survival that don't always feel so good. They often create more isolation and loneliness. And they do actually separate us from connection with other people. And at the core, that keeps us in that CPTSD 
in that state of functioning that is not necessarily about attunement and connection and leaning in and it's more about protection and um, and often isolation so or illness and things like that so thanks for watching and um, if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and I'll see you next time guys stay safe and well take care Bye.